Well, I want to welcome you to CCV this weekend. You are in for a real treat today. Before I tell you what that is, let me update you on two things. One, we are actively working our plan to regather as a church physically. We believe that is very important for those of you that are able to gather at this time. So please stay tuned and know our plan is for it to be very soon. Also, Next weekend, I'm going to start a brand new series that I'm incredibly passionate about called True North. If you're like me, when I look around in our world today, it seems like we're living in a day and age where everyone's compass is pointed a seemingly different direction. But there is a true north, and there's a way to get to true north. And we're going to talk about how to do just that. It all starts next weekend. And by the way, if you have someone in your life that doesn't know who Jesus is or is just searching right now, this is going to be the perfect series to invite them to. It all starts next weekend. But this weekend, it's my honor to introduce our guest speaker, Pastor Don Wilson. If you don't know who Don is, he's the pastor that founded CCV in his living room 38 years ago. And there are a few men that I know that have had the longevity the passion, and the consistency that Don's had for sharing Jesus and developing leaders. He and his amazing wife, Sue, now lead a ministry called Accelerate, where they invest in other churches and pastors. And Don is someone who's invested in me. He's a faithful man of God, a friend, and I can't wait for you to hear God speak through him today. If you have the CCV mobile app, you're going to want to open it right now. I think you'll want to take some notes today. So please help me welcome to the stage right now a hero of our church, Don Wilson. I want to welcome all of you watching us online today at CCV. We're honored to have you, that you would take the time to join us, and we pray that this service will add value uh, to your life. Uh, as I actually said three years ago, when my wife and I left uh, CCV, people said, they always asked me, how's retirement going? And I said, well, we didn't really retire. We reloaded. For the first two years, I was out of the state and the country over 100 days working with churches, and we have worked with 150 pastors and their wives in churches all over the United States. And I want you to know right now, they are really stressed out. We need to be praying for pastors and leaders of churches around the country. We need to pray for Ashley. I'm so proud of Ashley and what he's doing to lead this church. He has done an excellent job, and the pressure he's under right now with Black Lives Matter, with COVID, with everything that's going on, with the uncertainty of when to open, when not to open, he needs your prayers. He's doing a great job. Just continue to pray for him in every way. I called about 25 pastors this week, and I was talking to a pastor from another state, and I said, how are you doing? And he said, man, I am wiped out. He said, my, my staff is divided. People are leaving my church. He said, if I talk not enough about Black Lives Matter, some are leaving. If I talk too much about Black Lives Matter, some are leaving. If I don't open the church up for worship soon enough, some are leaving. If I say I'm going to open up, some are leaving. He said, I cannot win. And I want you to know that most pastors, Ashley included, leading a large influential church like this, is in a situation where he cannot please everybody and he cannot win in many situations. So we need to stay united and pray for each other and keep our focus on Jesus Christ. Because I believe the things that are happening today, in three months the election's going to come, our country is more divided than ever, and these things are leading the church away from its major mission of reaching people for Jesus Christ. I want to talk to you today about a message that I preached several years ago, and some of you have heard it before, some of you will not, this will be new to you, but the principles we shared before, I believe are even more relevant today because the church in the United States is losing its influence. It's losing its compass spiritually, and it's not impacting our culture like we used to. The idea for this message came from a book I read several years ago entitled Experiencing Spiritual Breakthrough by Dr. Bruce Wilkerson. 
And in that book, he talks about how easy it is for generation to generation to generation for people to, to spiritually move farther and farther away from God. And so I want to try and illustrate that by using three chairs today. The first chair, if you're a first chair person, it represents a Christian who is completely under the authority and direction of Jesus Christ. The key word there is completely. It's not someone that vacillates. They're in, they're out. They've made a decision to follow Jesus and make him the Lord of their life. And there's every day they say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Completely under that direction. The second chair, and that's where many of us are listening online today. We're followers of Jesus Christ. And this chair represents a Christian a Christ follower who is unsure of how much to surrender and follow Jesus Christ. The key is unsure. In the first chair, you're you're sold out. You're completely under that authority. But in this chair, we we say, wait a minute, I'm unsure of how much I want to go all in. And statistics say today that over 80% of people in churches in America today are in this second chair. And we need to understand that if we're unsure in our faith, And in our belief system, we're not going to have much to give to an unchurched world. The third chair, it's not a Christian. It represents a person who has not made a decision for Jesus Christ. They have not made a decision to make Jesus the Lord and leader of their life. Now, there are many examples of these three chairs throughout Scripture. We could go to Joshua. Joshua's a young man that followed Moses. And as he got ready to lead the people into the promised land, he made this statement to the people of where he was. He said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He was in the first chair, commitment to God. But we'll notice as you would read scripture that after he died, the second generation moved farther away from God and the third generation almost neglected God. You read on in the Old Testament and you come 400 years after Joshua and you come to King David. And we see this again in King David's life, his son Solomon, King Solomon, and the grandson, King Rehoboam. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 11. And here's what it said. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart to other gods And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord, his God, as the heart of David, his father, had been. In other words, we see there was a difference. This heart was was fully devoted to God, but this heart, it says here, he's not fully devoted to God. Then you read on about the grandson, Rehoboam. It says, but Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him, meaning the godly leaders of the community. He rejected their advice and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and we're serving him. Well, what do you think advice he got? If you grow up with your buddies and all of a sudden you become the king and you ask your friends, hey, what should I do? You think they're going to tell you what you need to hear? No, they're going to tell you what you want to hear. And so he found himself totally ignoring the vice of scriptural leaders and he turned completely away from God. How do these three chairs then play out in the different areas of our life? I want to take some time to look at those. First of all, how does it play out in our relationship to God? Well, it said that David, what's what? He was a man after God's own heart. So I would see David had a devoted heart. He was all in. He was sold out to God. Was he a sinner? Yes. Did he make mistakes? Yes. But the desire of his heart was to follow God first. And this is what's crucial for us living in the first chair. If you're a Christian living in the first chair, you must understand that the way you run your business, the way you raise your kids, all the decisions you make in life, you're trying to say, how can I put God first and advance the kingdom of Jesus Christ? The second chair represents Solomon. It says Solomon did what? He was not fully devoted to God. Why? Because he married many wives, and many of them had belief systems that were not like the true God Jehovah, and they caused his heart to be divided. And when we have a divided heart, we put ourselves first and God second. And you say, well, what, what do you mean? Well, when we put ourselves first and God second, we call ourselves a Christian, we're going to be at church unless there's something we want to do. We want to be involved in youth sports. COVID's kind of taken care of that. Or do I want to go to the lake or the mountains? Or or do I want to go play golf? Or what do we want to do? And if we're not careful, we can be a Christ follower in the second chair, but we find ourselves really living for ourselves first 
even though we say we love God. And so in this chair, there's a divided heart. What about the third chair, Rehoboam? Rehoboam didn't have a divided heart. Rehoboam had a dead heart. Why? He was living for himself only. His buddy said, hey, man, whatever you want to do, you're in charge. And so there was no desire to follow God in any way. A third chair person basically says, look, I'm, I'm going to live the way I want and do my own thing. What about the Bible? How do these chairs fit into the Bible? Well, the first chair, if you're in the first chair, you obey the Bible. You read the Bible, you know the Bible, and you obey the Bible. You make your decisions based upon the Bible. God, what do you want me to do? It's the way I'm going to live. If you're in the second chair, you don't obey the Bible, you respect the Bible. You'll read it once in a while. You'll follow it in some areas of your life, but the other areas of your life that you don't think you want to follow that way, you, you will go a different way. The third chair, they pretty much own a Bible. They pretty much own a Bible. What about values? How do we determine values in our culture? Because if I look at what's happening in America today, it's basically because we are a society that has totally different values, and where we get our values is the key. If you're in the first chair, your values come, again, from the Bible, the Word of God. You make your decisions, God, how do you want me to live? And because of that, first chair Christians tend to be very consistent and one of the keys to raising children is what? Consistency. No matter how you are, if you're consistent, your children know how you're going to react. But if you're inconsistent, it causes all kinds of problems. And so in the first chair, your values come from the Bible. What about the second chair? Well, it comes from the Bible plus other sources. Bible plus other. Not the Bible only, the Bible plus. What about the third chair? They're not Christians. They don't use the Bible at all. So there's, their source is basically society, the culture in which we live. Now, as I go through this, I want you to understand the problem. I think a major problem happening today in our culture is that where do we get our truth source? 80% of the people right here, they're no longer, the Bible's not their main source. It's the Bible plus. Where do we get our values today? I would suggest to you that I think our values today come from the media more than anything else. They come from celebrities and athletes. Uh, they come from education and especially what we see in liberal universities today. Now, there are Christians in universities. There are Christians in celebrities. There are Christians in the media. But by and large, many of them are not following biblical principles. And I will say to you, these are the things that are impacting the church of Jesus Christ because many Christians get caught up in following their ideas instead of what God's Word says. And so many of the cultural issues that we're going through today, why is it so divisive? Because we're not depending on what the Bible says. We're basically looking at what media tells us or what some source that we respect tells us. And I want you to know, as long as that happens, we're never going to be unified as a country. We're going to continually be divided. You had an election coming in 100 days on top of that, and we will be even more divided. Because we're not making our decisions on what the Bible says our values come from what everybody else is telling us. What about our career? How does this work in our career? If you're a first chair Christian, your career you see is God's call. And whether you're an employee or an employer, you're saying, you know what, my job, my business, I want to do everything I can to reach as many people for Jesus Christ and expand the kingdom as I can. That is your purpose in life. You see that as your ministry. You say, well, wait a minute, I thought pastors were in the ministry. No, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, every one of us is in the ministry. Our purpose is to share the gospel. What about the second chair? If you're in the second chair, remember you're living for yourself first and you love God. You don't see it as God's call. You see it as God's blessing. What's the difference? In this chair, we're more concerned about financial security. God, give me a good job to bless me that I can take care of my family. What about the third chair? The third chair, it's not God's call or blessing. It's simply my ability. 
I don't believe in God, so if I'm going to get ahead, I'm going to work hard, I'm going to study hard, I'm going to get a good education, I'm going to do everything I can to the best of my ability so that I can what? I can enjoy life as I want. What about marriage? Profound difference. The first chair person, marriage is a covenant. It's an unconditional covenant. When my wife and I got married almost 52 years ago, we made an unconditional covenant. What are you talking about, Don? I promise to love you in sickness as in health, richer or poorer, till better for worse, till death do us part. It was an unconditional covenant, meaning no matter how the conditions change, we are in this together. We've not had a divorce because we made a commitment never to mention the word divorce. So far, it's worked. However, me being home all this time with COVID, it's putting major stress on my marriage, all right? Um, I've never done so many dishes in my life. My hands are so soft, it scares me, all right? But whatever it takes for my marriage. What about the second chair? The second chair, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a covenant. The second chair, it's a contract, and that contract is conditional. You say, what do you mean? When you put conditions on your marriage contract, what you say is, as long as you meet my needs, as long as you keep me happy, as long as you take care of me, I'm with you. But when you quit meeting my needs, you no longer make me happy, then I'll go out and find somebody else. Because in this chair, even though we're Christians, we still put ourselves first. What about the third chair? It's more of a convenience because you really don't have to get married nowadays. It's not accepted in our society, necessary in our society like it used to be. And so basically, you might get married after you've lived together for quite a while. Who knows? You kind of want the recognition of the community. Now, I hope what you're seeing as I'm going through this message is there's a great deal of difference between a Christian who puts God first and a Christian who is unsure how to live. There's very little difference between a self-centered Christian who loves God and a person that's not a Christian that totally is self-centered. We see that in marriage today. You look at what our society is telling us today. My wife and I have lived in an apartment for the last two and a half years. I see people, couples, going in and out of the apartments, and I'll try to carry on a conversation with them, and I'm old-fashioned, so I'll end up pretty soon saying, how long you've been married? And to my surprise, probably 80% of the people say we're not married. They live together. And one of the dangerous things today is there's so many people that are part of CCV and churches all over America that are living together and they're not married, and they call themselves followers of Jesus Christ. And I know, I want to tell you, when we do this, we are losing our witness. There's got to be a difference between our values and our lifestyle and the people that don't know Jesus Christ. That's the struggle, then, with marriage. We've got to make a commitment, because what happens? Today, look at Hollywood. Look at what we see. So-and-so had a baby. Are they married? Who knows? Because when you no longer have the marriage vows and you have the nuclear family of a mom and dad, when the marriage breaks down, the family breaks down, and when the family breaks down, our society will break down. That's why it is crucial that those of us that call ourselves Jesus followers in the second chair have to reevaluate our values and our marriage and our commitment to each other. What about how we raise kids? Parenting. If you're in the first chair... You're confident. You're confident. Why? You do everything you can to abide, apply biblical principles. When you run into discipline, when you run into to, to your kids that have problems with their peers, what do you do? You try to take them back to the Bible and say, what does the Bible say about this? You're confident. You're consistent. Does that mean that all of your kids are going to grow up and stay in the first chair? No, not 100%. But the statistics are overwhelming that 90% of the kids that grow up in this chair stay here. Why? Because their parents are confident and consistent. My grandparents were Christians, but they were second chair. My wife's grandparents were second chair Christians. But when my mom and dad got married, they said, we are going to be different. When my wife's parents got different, married. They said, we're going to live our lives differently. And we're so blessed, my wife and I, that both of our parents are first chair Christians. So we decided that we were going to be first chair. We were going to put God first no matter what. We have been so blessed. We prayed that our kids 
would be Christians. We prayed that our kids would marry a Christian spouse. God has honored that. And then immediately we started praying the very safe thing for our grandkids. I'm, I'm so blessed that all three of my kids are in the first chair. My grandkids are all followers of Jesus Christ, and they're doing everything they can to be in the first chair, and we encourage them all the time. How can you put God first? And I believe it's important even for us as grandparents to try and reinforce these values and make sure our kids are growing up and loving Jesus Christ. Two years ago, when 22 of us got together in our apartment, all three generations for Christmas, we stopped and said, wait a minute, this year had a few gifts, this year would you talk about what God's been doing in your life? And one of the granddaughters just got back from a, being away for a year on a mission trip, and she began to share. And it was incredible. This last year, we said, hey, not everything goes perfect in the Christian life. So this year, why don't you share the struggles you've gone through as a Christian, and how are you doing? And we all were able to share together, because we believe as grandparents, it's even our job to also help reinforce those values and those first chair things of how do we put God first. So what we're saying, in this chair, you're confident. In the second chair, you're hopeful. Why? Because you don't apply biblical principles, but you're influenced by biblical principles. And in this chair, if we're not careful, we kind of want other people, maybe we put our kids in the youth group so they'll have Christian principles, or maybe we'll send them to a Christian school to have Christian principles, and all those are okay, but I want you to know if you're in the first chair, you see it as your responsibility to teach biblical principles. If we're not careful in the second chair, we want other people to teach them, and we're going to come alongside what other people are doing. What about the third chair? For the third chair, those parents are confused because they say, we don't have the Bible. We look at around at what's going on. We read this book. We hear this person on TV. We see this on social media. We don't know who to follow, and we don't know what we can do to give our kids the best advice. And so everything looks great, you see, in this chair until what? Until COVID hits, and you lose your job, or you get a divorce, or your grandparent or your friends die, and when that happens, everything, the foundation falls out from under it, and that's where we are today in our culture. People that are not in the first chair do not have the right foundation to deal with all the struggles we're going through. So let me ask you some questions. Which chair has the most stressed out people? You'd say, well, I think it's the third chair. They don't know Jesus. No, the third chair people, are, they really are pretty stress-free. You know why? They've decided how they're going to live their life. It's all for themselves. And so every day they get up and say, what do I want to do? And they're pretty good with that. What about the first chair? No, the first chair aren't stressed out because, again, they've said, we're not going to try to please everybody. We're going to live for an audience of one, and we want to please God more than anything that we do. And so they're pretty stress-free. Those that have the most stress are right here in the second chair because one day they're trying to please God, the next day they're trying to please their unchurched friends or they're trying to please their parents or trying to please their spouse or trying to please their kids and they have incredible stress. Okay? If you're a parent, which chair do your kids end up in? This to me was one of the most profound things in the study that was done with this book several years ago. Parents in the first chair by and large, their kids grow up and stay in the first chair. You know why? Because they saw consistent, godly, biblical values modeled day in and day out. And that consistency gave them security. The third chair people, we found out that for the study, that those that grow up in the third chair, their kids grow up in the third chair. Because if you're in a home where your parents are self-centered and everybody's selfish, what makes you all of a sudden going to want to start thinking of others? You grow up living for yourself as well. What they found out was the majority of the kids that are children of second chair Christians, when they grow up and leave home, they move to the third chair and lose their relationship with Jesus Christ, and it breaks their parents' heart. Why? Because mom and dad, you can call yourself a Christian, but if you're living for yourself, what happens is your kids see the inconsistency. It doesn't work long term. And the first time they go to a secular university and they counter a, a, a non-believing, atheistic professor challenges everything about their spiritual values and their base, they do not have a solid base and they will walk away because they did not see the real deal. So let me ask you, what chair are you in? 
today. What chair are you in? Most of you are followers of Jesus Christ. And one of the amazing things when I've preached this message before, most of the people that I see afterwards and I began to talk to them and I would say, what chair are you in? You know what they tell me? Pastor Don, I think I'm right between the second chair and the third chair. Can I help you out? If you say I'm between the second chair and the third chair, you know where you are? You're in the second chair. Because you either are living your life to put God first and please him, or at some degree, you're still living for yourself. And listen, that is called selfish lifestyle, and selfish Christians will never impact a sinful world. You know why? They see very little difference in the long haul between the way we live. So what changes do all of us need to make so that we can move to the first chair? If you're watching online today, and maybe you're not a Christ follower, and you'd say, you know what, I, I didn't realize there was so much difference. You're right. My values are coming from the world. Uh, I am inconsistent with COVID now and everything that's going on. I, I'm, I'm lacking confidence. I need some hope. You need to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can't make it to heaven on just being a good person. You know why? None of us are good enough on our own. We're all sinners that have fallen short of the glory of God. God's standard was holiness without sin. And when we sin, we, f we, sh we fall short of the mark. Well, how in the world can we get to the mark? You accept God's gift. For God so loved the world that he sent Jesus, that if we believe in him, we would not die, but we would live forever. Why is Jesus the big deal? Because Jesus, God's son, was the only one who has lived on planet earth without sin. When he was crucified and shed his blood on the cross, he died in our place and took our sin upon himself so that we then could be perceived as holy and righteous in the eyes of Almighty God. The only way we get to heaven is accepting God's gift of Jesus Christ. You need to receive that. What about the first chair? The first chair, you need to recommit. Because I want you to know things are changing. If you'd have told me the church in America would be shut down by the government in, for six months, years ago, I'd have told you you're nuts. Just this week in Nevada, what happened? A church in Nevada, outside of Reno, said, we want to have 50% of our people in our seats because the casino has 50%. They had an auditorium that seated 200, and so that meant they wanted to have 100. And the governor, governor said, no, you can only have 50 people. You can't have 50%, even though the casinos can have hundreds of people and have 50% capacity. So they took that all the way to the Supreme Court. And Friday, the Supreme Court of the United States denied the church's request. That's a violation of the constitutional First Amendment of the freedom of worship. My friends, that is the beginning of what's going to happen. And if you choose to live in the first chair as a Christian, you are going to face more and more persecution when you stand for biblical truth. More and more of our culture is going to cancel you out and want nothing with what you have to say. But here's the good news. Society experts say that 10% of people, if 10% of the population is all in and committed to their, 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 their cause, they can radically over time change society. And so if just 10% of people who are followers of Jesus Christ would stay in this chair and do whatever it takes to live the life that is different and put God first, we can bring revival to this country. Matthew 6, for a first chair, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be taken care of. You've got to live for an audience of one. Well, what about those in the, in the second chair? And I want to say to us in love, as Christians in this chair, that you're trying to keep it both ways. You love God, but you're still selfish and putting yourself first. We need to repent. We need to repent I praise God for the number of baptisms CCV's had in the past three years. It's incredible. But the real issue is not do you get baptized and get a shirt that says I'm changed if you're not changed. If you don't repent when you're baptized, it's a symbol that you're dying to your old self, self-centeredness, and I am putting God first. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. There's got to be a significant change 
or baptism is of no value. Jesus said, if you want to come after me in Luke 9, 23, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. What does that mean? That means if we're going to follow Jesus Christ and give our lives to him up front, he said, wait a minute, it's going to be surrender, it's going to be sacrifice, you've got to be a servant. So what's the new normal? I believe if we're going to change the world, if we're going to change this culture today, it's going to take a drastic move from Christians in this chair, and the new normal is we've got to be selfless. Not selfish, but selfless. What does that mean? For pastors, that means we can't please everybody, so we've got to preach the Word of God with boldness, whether we're afraid of losing our job or not. It means as policemen, we've got to avoid excessive physical rebu- uh, abuse regardless of the skin color. It means for protesters, we've got to protest peacefully without destroying somebody else's property. For politicians, it means you've got to take a stand and do what's best for our country instead of doing what you can to get reelected. For Christians, it means we're no longer just consumers. We go to church because the music's good, the sermons are good, the programs are good. What can we get out of it? But it's because we're willing to be selfless and we want to be contributors. What does that mean? I'm going to give of my time, I'm going to give of my resources, and I'm going to give of my witness. One thing about COVID right now, we have more time to be around and and invest in our neighbors with so many working at home than we've ever had before, probably in our lifetime. What a great opportunity to get to know your friends, share time with them, let them see the authenticity, let them see that your life is different, and then take the opportunity to share with them your love for Jesus Christ. There are several times I lived in Phoenix and I didn't do a good job reaching my neighbors. I tried, but I didn't have much success. The last few years, we lived in a neighborhood where we found some people that weren't in the first chair. We began to talk to them, pour into their lives, do things together with them, and after about four years, they finally made a decision for Jesus Christ, and they're totally living in the first chair, sold out. And I want you to know, that was one of the greatest joys in my life and in my ministry, to see my neighbors come to Jesus Christ. I want you to listen to the story of a couple at CCV that did just that. They, They moved into the first chair, and because of that, they had a burden for their neighbors, And they said, what can we do to build a relationship to them that we can get them close to understanding the difference Jesus has made in our lives? Would you listen to their story? My name's Matt, and this is my wife, Tracy, and we attend the North Phoenix campus. I kept asking Rick, you know, come to church. You guys would enjoy it. You would really love the message. And this is a series this week, and I think you'd get a lot out of it. You know, it was a pretty constant thing, and sometimes the invite was more like, this is what the Sunday service was about. Really should have been there, jokingly. And then as soon as they announced that they were opening the campus here at North Phoenix, um, I had invited Rick. I sent him a text. I just left it there. I told my husband about it, and I said, okay, I'm giving this to God. I'm tired. (laughs) (laughs) And so the campus opened up, and we were able to come and write a prayer or scripture, anything we wanted before they set the flooring down. And so we were walking into the doors, and uh, my mom tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, look who's here. And from a distance by all the tables that were set up, Uh, There was Rick standing there with all the information in his hands from all the tables. And I just ran up to him and I was just almost in tears. And I said, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I came to find out about this church. (laughs) It took me 10 years because, um, I guess because the experience that I had had with church, I guess you could say, growing up, so I didn't know anything I didn't know any different. God does everything for a reason. And this was my time to put my leap of faith forward and give CCV a chance. There was 
many times that I would literally walk away and go, oh, I blew that one. <laughs> you just have to step out in faith. You have to be able to just really take that opportunity and be brave and let, leave it there. Let God do his part. I just knew what God was gonna do, and he did. Brett got baptized, um, his wife got baptized. My sister, my daughter, um, my son-in-law, it's just brought us all so much closer together. It doesn't really take a lot of effort to talk to people about something that you enjoy doing. Just, it, it's just changed me so much. It's, I've gotten, like I said, it, uh, I've gotten a whole new family out of this and a whole new outlook on life that I'm able to share with anybody who will listen. My part is just, you know, like what happened with me, like with Tracy and Matt, they just showed me the way. They just said, hey, try it out. So ever since then, I've just been hooked and doing my best to spread the good word and get as many people as I can to go and, you know, follow Jesus. That's what it means to be selfless. That's what it means to live in the first chair where you're willing to invest the time, you're willing to pray, you're willing to take the opportunity to invite them to church, watch online, but you're also willing when they have questions to talk to them about the Jesus that's made a difference in your life. If your life is different, people will notice. That's why it's important for us to make sure we're living in the first chair and loving and serving God. Apostle Paul put it this way, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Why? Your attitude should be the same of that of Christ Jesus. The opportunity for evangelism right now for what we're going through in this country and this community is incredible. Let's, let's sit in the first chair. Let's make sure we're going to heaven and let's take as many people with us as we can. Let's pray. Lord God, we love you. And we realize we're living in a time right now that there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of information coming from every which way, and many of us don't know what to do or what to believe. I pray from this message today we would see the importance of living for God first and living with biblical truth and doing everything we can to model Jesus in every way. And that means we can't be selfish. We've got to be selfless. Lord, I pray that all of us today watching, we'd think of a coworker or neighbor or friend that we've put off spending some time with them. We've put off building a relationship. We've put off inviting them to tune into our church. Lord, give us the courage to make that a priority this week. Lord, I pray for pastors all over the country that are struggling right now because of all the uncertainty. Give them confidence, give them courage, give them boldness. Lord, I pray for Ashley and all the team here at CCV, all the staff as they lead, continue to give them boldness, give them wisdom, God. Help them to see what others cannot see and by your Holy Spirit, direct them in the way they should go and the decisions that they should make. Keep us unified, Lord, so that we have a powerful witness to the world. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.